Thank you for watching the recording of Vaccines Under the Microscope. How can we know they are safe? This session was presented by Dr. Paul Carson on September 19th, 2024. To earn continuing medical education, also known as CME credit, you must complete the pretest, watch the recorded webinar, and complete the post test and evaluation. To access the pretest, please scan the QR code or follow the link available on the screen. For those seeking one maintenance of certification point or the American Board of Pediatrics or for the American Board of Internal Medicine, you must watch the recording and complete the post test and evaluation. MLC points are only available for board certified doctors, fellows, or residents. Details on how to access the post-test and evaluation will be available at the end of the recording. Enduring CME and MOC points will be available for watching this recording until June 30th, 2025. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Tracy Newman, and I'm the medical director at NDSU Siri. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Paul Carson, who will be presenting this webinar titled, Vaccines Under the Microscope, How Can We Know They Are Safe? Dr. Carson is an infectious disease physician with over 25 years of clinical experience. He is currently an emeritus professor of practice in the North Dakota State University Department of Public Health where he founded and previously served as the medical director for the Center for Immunization Research and Education. He is also a professor at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. He has held many roles within Sanford, including chair of the Department of Infectious Diseases, director of clinical research and chief quality officer. Dr. Carson, welcome, you can begin. Great. Um... Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Maybe good evening. I don't know how big our reach is today. Uh, welcome uh, to everyone. I'm happy to be able to be with you to go over, I think, what is a really important topic, which is, is really kind of addressing um, a lot of the safety concerns and hesitancy that we're seeing in, uh, in the general population and a lot of our patients. Um, and I think that really starts with us having confidence in our vaccines and their safety. And that, I think, starts with understanding the process by which we ascertain whether they're safe or not. And I'm going to go through that um, in some detail with you today. Uh, here are the um, uh, disclosures and maintenance of certification statement. Um, we are supported by a grant from the CDC, uh, and I have no relevant financial relationships uh, uh, to disclose. Um, so the uh, objectives for uh, today's presentation, if I can get this to advance, sticking on me here, here we go, um, it are, the, are the following. Uh, this is what I kind of hope to accomplish with you. Uh, first is to recognize how the safety is prioritized in the vaccine development and our approval process. Second is to identify the differences between vaccine safety surveillance systems in the U.S. and how they collaborate to assess potential safety. And then finally, I wanna go over some historical examples of how vaccine surveillance systems have successfully identified and responded to safety concerns. Um, so let's first just acknowledge uh, what an incredible uh, benefit vaccines have been um, to the world in the, uh, really over the last century. When we look at, um, e even in the 1900s here, 20th century annual morbidity or, or significant illness from um, the diseases on the left, uh, we can see tens to hundreds of thousands of cases of illness from these various uh, scourges that were uh, major problems for um, uh, mostly children, but uh, all ages uh, in the last century. <clears throat> and we can see in, you know, as of 2021, uh, the uh, annual incidence of those uh, uh, cases or numbers of those cases and the dramatic declines uh, that have occurred, which are almost um, uh, almost in the largest part due to the advent of vaccines. Smallpox uh, gone, diphtheria essentially gone, uh, measles markedly reduced, um, 
uh, mumps, pertussis, polio, rubella, uh, congenital rubella syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. Most of these things have uh, um, over 97 to 99% reductions um, with the advent of vaccines. But in therein actually kind of lies the problem. We are, we've been so successful at eliminating or uh, so, so markedly reducing these diseases that they faded from our collective consciousness. And people no longer really perceive these as a significant threat. When, when I talk to some of um, you know, the elderly members of my family uh, or friends or acquaintances that, that they can readily recall some of these diseases from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and are sort of shocked that people no longer, you know, think about these or care about these because they were very real uh, in their families just a few decades ago. Uh, and so I think accordingly, um, we've seen uh, people perceiving that maybe the risks of the vaccine are greater than the risks of these diseases, which for the most part, they don't see. Uh, and uh, here we can see from the Gallup poll that uh, the, the author of this report notes that faith in vaccines have fallen 10%. And that was uh, January of 2020, prior to COVID. Uh, COVID, I think, uh, substantially contributed to a loss of uh, trust in our, our traditional public health systems and in vaccine confidence. And uh, when we look now uh, at, you know, the general population, we see that uh, somewhere around 50 to 60 percent of Americans have some or great concerns about vaccine safety. So a, a substantial portion of the population is contending with this in one way or another. And we know that our, our patients and our loved ones um, often are somewhere on a spectrum of, of vaccine acceptance versus uh, hesitancy. So when, you know, the one hand, on the one end of this, we have um, uh, uh, patients and, and uh, families that are willing to accept pretty much every, anything the doctor or the provider recommends uh, to the far other end of the spectrum where they're going to refuse uh, all vaccines. And, and they're, they're more likely to tell you why, what you don't understand about vaccines. But the majority of the population is somewhere in this sort of center where they may be unsure or accepting some, delaying and refusing others, or more inclined to refuse, but are, aren't certain in their hesitancy, uh, whether that's the best thing. And that's where we we especially want to uh, aim our efforts um, in, in helping people become more confident. Now, the World Health Organization has recognized uh, that vaccine hesitancy is, is one of the greatest uh, global threats. Um, so even in 2019, again, before the COVID pandemic, they had listed on um, uh, one of their major reports that vaccine hesitancy was one of the top 10 uh, greatest threats to global health. Um, and I suspect that's only gotten worse in the last few years. And this is having real world consequences. We've seen the outbreaks of things like measles with the Disneyland outbreak. Uh, that was an old outbreak of measles in Minnesota, now a more recent one. Things like um, uh, pertussis making comeback, polio making a comeback, uh, you know, and here uh, um, the first polio case not too long ago. Um, being detected in New York State, uh, almost unthinkable, um, you know, a decade or so ago. Uh, so the, 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 and these are almost, uh, um, almost exclusively, uh, like, for example, our, our recent uh, measles outbreak uh, in Minnesota was almost exclusively in uh, unvaccinated um, children. Um, so it, it really is incumbent on us to uh, try and help uh, overcome this uh, hesitancy by um, being confident ourselves that we have a, a process that uh, assures that our vaccines are safe. We, we want our vaccines certainly be to, to be effective and necessary, but uh, most especially we wanna know that they're safe. Um, that's, uh, that's in multiple surveys, the primary concern for people when it comes to hesitancy. So what does safe mean? Um, so uh, what it does not mean is zero risk. Okay, nothing has zero risk. Taking an aspirin does not have zero risk. Taking your Motrin doesn't have zero risk. Everything has some degree of risk. Getting in my car and driving my kids to school has some risk. Um, so we don't mean zero risk, but we are trying to weigh the risks and benefits of, uh, of the vaccine and more importantly of the pathogen uh, that um, people may be exposed to. So that includes what's the incidence or likelihood of acquisition of that pathogen, and uh, what are the likely uh, uh, serious outcomes uh, from exposure and acquisition of that pathogen compared 
to uh, the safety uh, of the vaccine. And we'd like that difference to be at a pretty wide margin because we're giving vaccines to, uh, for the most part, healthy people. So let's kind of walk through uh, some of the process of uh, how how a vaccine comes, uh, you know, comes to uh, approval from the development process up to public availability, and what are the processes involved to assuring that they are safe. So this really um, is housed under the authority of the uh, Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. Um, the FDA must license a vaccine before it can be used in the U.S. And so the FDA has a number of different requirements for that to happen. They uh, require that uh, the vaccine components have a purity standard, that if they go from one lot to the next or one manufacturing plant to the next, you're getting the same product um, in, in, a, in a pure form that does not uh, vary significantly. Um, they want to assure that it's potent. Uh, they want to know that it's effective. And most importantly, they want to know that it's safe before they're going to license this. So what does that uh, process entail? Um, so the traditional uh, um, process often is a timeline that spans 10 to 15 years. And a big chunk of that is in this um, exploratory and preclinical phase. So this is the you know laboratory tests, um, and then it go, often goes on to animal tests. Um, and if you can show that you've got a, a pure product uh, that can be reliably manufactured and it appears to be immunogenic and, and uh, hopefully uh, protective in animals, then the vaccine manufacturer can file what's called investigation of new drug uh, application. That's, that's uh, an application to the FDA to say, may we begin human trials? If the um, FDA is satisfied that the animal data and preclinical data and laboratory data is um, uh, adequate, uh, they will grant that license and then they can start phase one, um, and maybe phase two and phase three trials. So phase one trials are usually in small groups of people. Um, they may be dozens uh, um, and they're and it's looking primarily to see if there's an immune response. Uh, do, are they getting you know the anticipated immune response? Um, uh, sometimes that may be with dose finding as well, like what's the best dose? And to make sure that you know, they'll also look for any major safety signals signals. If that all looks okay, it can move on to phase two, which uh, is a greater number uh, of people. And again, is now looking uh, harder at um, uh, um, immuno immunogenic response. Uh, uh, this may be more specific to dose finding, to finding the optimal response, and a little uh, more data on safety signals. If that uh, all looks okay, then they may proceed on to phase three studies, which are typically thousands to tens of thousands of subjects where you're now uh, comparing them to a control group. So you have a uh, vaccinated population compared to either an unvaccinated or whatever the current um, standard of care is. And you're comparing these in much larger populations with the intent of looking at both efficacy, so you, you want to see does it actually prevent uh, the disease and target in that population, and most importantly, safety. Are there any major safety signals? If that all looks okay, then they can uh, file uh, um, uh, a, a licensing application. The FDA will then look, look at usually it's thousands of pages of documentation that are required. Um, that can take months uh, to review, and if that uh, all passes muster, they'll grant uh, that license and then the um, manufacturer can start making the vaccine and um, distributing that for administration of the population. Um, so those are the various steps along the way. Um, here's just another pictogram of that. Um, and kind of layered on top of that is when you look at potential new vaccines making the way through the pipeline, a whole lot of them never even get approved for those phase one, two or three studies. Of those that do and, and wait, make their way through the process, you may have um, dozens of vaccine candidates with only maybe one uh, making it uh, through to uh, licensure. And on average, only about 10 to 12 percent of all vaccine candidates make it uh, to that stage. Then um, to, to just kind of uh, put a finishing touch on this, the FDA, along with the CDC, then do continued um, uh, monitoring for safety signals, even after 
uh, licensure. These are the post-approval monitoring and research activities, and we're going to go into some details about uh, these as well. Um, here's a few of the different uh, uh, vaccines and their phase three trials that were required for licensure. So you can kind of see that um, in, in those phase three trials, this is the total number of study subjects. And they're, you know, on the lowest end here uh, at the top is the RotaShield, uh, the original rotavirus vaccine. We're going to talk more about that as a case example in a minute uh, with only 4,400 total subjects, but most of them in the tens of thousands uh, of subjects uh, studied. These are, uh, I participated in these as a, um, um, uh, a researcher for uh, some of these vaccine trials, very rigorous, lots of paperwork, uh, very, very detailed, very difficult to do, um, very expensive, take a long time, uh, and, um, uh, meet, have to meet a very, very high bar. <laughs> so what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of these, uh, uh, of this initial process. So the strengths are, this is a stepwise safety and efficacy assessment. They are rigorous. These are the best uh, type of a study uh, as far as um, eliminating bias and finding true effects. Um, phase three, randomized placebo controlled trials, usually blinded. Um, so they're, they're good at decreasing bias. They're better at assuring group equivalence that you're kind of comparing apples to apples. They're better at getting the actual vaccine effects, both efficacy and risks. And they're typically powered to detect efficacy and common adverse events. Um, the limitations are that um, they can't detect very rare adverse events. When you, you've got thousands to maybe tens of thousands of study subjects, you're not going to detect um, an adverse event that's maybe in the, you know, one out of a hundred thousand uh, people, nor can they detect very late or delayed adverse events. <clears throat> they're expensive and they're difficult to do. They take a very long time and often pediatric populations and pregnant uh, women are often studied at a much later date. Now let's kind of focus on uh, two that I think are uh, of the most common concerns expressed by um, patients or the general population. And that, is, that is, you know, are, are we detecting every uh, adverse event or even rare ones? And are we detecting very late or delayed ad adverse events? Let me first ad address the second one here, delayed side effects. Uh, I'll put out a statement here, and I've, I've yet to have this um, uh, proven wrong, and, and uh, experts in vaccine safety and, and trial process will say this as well, that in the history of all vaccines licensed in the United States, no serious adverse event or side effect has been found after six to eight weeks after the vaccine has been given. Now, um, uh, that makes some sense when you think about how vaccines, the vast majority of the time, uh, lead to a potential side effect. Um, it, it's usually either a direct toxic effect from the vaccine components itself. And that's usually going to appear in the first few days or maybe a couple weeks after the vaccine is given when the amounts of the vaccine ingredients are still highest in the body. Um, or uh, it may be due to uh, the immune response elicited by the vaccine and that immune response causing some untoward effect that you don't want. And the immune uh, response typically peaks somewhere around four to six weeks. So we would expect those type of side effects uh, to appear most often in that uh, window of uh, one to two months. Uh, there is a rare exception to this that I can talk about in the question and answer period uh, later that wasn't in any US licensed vaccine, but it's something called um, uh, um, antip antibody dependent enhancement. It's a, a rare immunologic problem that uh, can that um, has affected the dengue vaccine not licensed in the US. Um, and can and can be delayed. Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of worth uh, thinking about like how good are we at detecting uh, you know uh, adverse events? And I'm going to get you know if you want to nerd out a little bit here, a little bit, stick with me on this slide. If if this sort of thing bores you, just glaze over for a second here before we get on to the next thing. So, um, a, a, a quick little cheat, statistical cheat or rule of thumb that you can use is something called the rule of three. And we can, it's a statistical uh, um, observation that is a shortcut to more sophisticated statistical testing. And the rule of three uh, states that you can be 95% confident 
that your sample size, or n, can detect events at a rate of 3 over n or greater. So kind of giving an example of that, let's take the uh, um, phase 3 trial for the Pfizer uh, mRNA COVID vaccine. <clears throat> um, that trial had 44,000 participants, so 22,000 in the vaccine arm, 22,000 in the uh, placebo arm. So if we use the rule of three, we can say we can be 95% confident that we should be able to detect three over 22,000 participants in that tri uh, the vaccine arm for a, a percentage of 0 0.0136, or we should be able to find events that are as common or more common than one out of 7,300, roughly. So that's pretty good. It, it, you know, that, that would be a pretty rare event, um, but it's not. We're not going to detect something that happens one out of 10,000 uh, shots. Um, and we'd like to know that, right? We'd like to know even rarer than that. But um, uh, but from this, we can say we, we can be 95% confident that we should be able to detect serious adverse events occurring at a rate of 3 over N, which in this case comes out to greater than or equal to 1 out of uh, about 7,300. If you want to know if it's statistically different than the background rate of that problem, then you got to compare that same rate in the placebo arm. So just kind of hold this in your mind, this, this rule of three, when we kind of think about some future um, case examples here. Um, and, you know, vaccines can cause serious uh, adverse events. These are some of the recognized known um, serious adverse events from some vaccines. So all vaccines roughly have an anaphylaxis rate of about one out of a million. Our, our phase three trials aren't going to detect that. And in the case of the COVID vaccine, it was a little more common than that. It was uh, closer to maybe four out of a million. Um, but the, the, the trials didn't find that. We had to find that in post-marketing surveillance systems, which we're going to talk a lot more about in a second. Um, influenza is known to cause Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, maybe one to at the highest 10 per million, which is actually substantially lower than uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome caused by influenza itself. Uh, but it is a known potential complication. Measles, mumps, rubella can cause uh, idiopathic uh, thrombocytopenic purpura in about one out of 40,000. MMR vaccine can cause febrile seizures, particularly in uh, young children, in, in uh, rates out of one out of 2,500 or one out of 1,250 with the MMRV. Um, the Rota Shield uh, uh, original rotavirus vaccine led to intussusception, uh, you know, telescoping of the bowel with intestinal blockage in about one out of 11,000 infants. And the subsequent versions of the rotavirus vaccine, um, the, particularly like the Rotatech, uh, dropped that down to about one out of 100,000. We're gonna use that a little later as a case example on how different systems work. All right, so now let's move to the post-licensure vaccine safety monitoring systems in the US. Um, first, uh, you know, uh, for our CME purposes, a, a question for you to ponder. We don't have an audience participation uh, participation system uh, built in right now, but just kind of think about this. I'm not going to give you the answer. I want you to think about this question and see if you can answer it after we go through the next few slides. So which of the following best describes the key difference between the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, and Vaccine Safety Data Link, another uh, major system uh, employed for our uh, vaccine safety surveillance? A, both systems rely on active data collection. B, VAERS is a passive reporting system, while Vaccine Safety Data Link actively monitors healthcare data. C, Vaccine Safety Data Link <laughs> um, focuses only on childhood vaccines, while VAERS covers all ages. Or D, VAERS is the only system that can establish causality between vaccines and adverse events. So think about that. See if you can answer that now. See if you can answer it here in a in a few more minutes. So let's look at these various systems that uh, we use in the United States uh, to better assure uh, vaccine uh, safety. Um, so uh, first, we're going to start with the sort of centerpiece here, which is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Hopefully, all of you who are providers uh, uh, or pharmacists are well familiar with this because we are actually required by law to report serious adverse, any serious adverse event we suspect following a vaccination in our uh, patients. Um, and, and serious adverse events means either death or hospitalization. But we can, re we can report any uh, concern after vaccine into VAERS. 
and it's not just providers. Anyone uh, can um, report into this, um, including uh, patients or anyone from the general uh, population. So this is used by the FDA and the CDC to collect reports of adverse events that happen after a vaccine. It is a passive reporting system, meaning it, meaning it relies on individuals and healthcare providers to send in reports of adverse health events. You, you, you know, again, we are required. Do we always do that? Uh, not always, but we really, really should be making strong efforts to do that. Scientists monitor this uh, system and the reports to identify adverse events that need to be studied further. Uh, emphasis on there. It doesn't end there. Um, these, these reports of adverse events are then followed up on with additional research, um, unexpected events or things that happen to appear more often than expected. We are trying to find patterns in, in the, you know, all, all the kinds of reports that uh, come in there. We're looking for a signal. It is, it is essentially an early warning system. And what VAERS is trying to do is cast a very wide net um, uh, to, to fish out any potential signals that might be out there. Uh, the strengths of this are, is that it's a wide net. Anyone can submit a report to VAERS, and it can serve as an early warning hypothesis generating system. Uh, but it has some major limitations. It is passive, meaning it's not going to capture all adverse events. It, and it doesn't have a true denominator. We, if an event comes in with, you know, uh, some serious uh, uh, um, adverse event that appears to be, you know, more than we might expect, we, we don't have a denominator of that. How many people got vaccinated? You know, what what's the percentage? We can't we can't say that from VAERS. Most importantly, there is no control group to compare rates in vaccinated versus unvaccinated populations, so you cannot determine causality. Big emphasis here. It can only raise questions. And often, especially when it comes from uh, you know, the general population, these reports may lack details or contain errors. Um, so you, you, don't, you don't know that you're getting really uh, um, accurate information. Um, and this is a problem because uh, um, this database, which is also publicly available, anybody can look at the results out of this. Um, the CDC tries to be very transparent uh, with this process and as such makes this data available to the general population. And you can see all kinds of people uh, who uh, may not know how to mine this data very uh, carefully, um, drawing all kinds of uh, conclusions that they really shouldn't be out of there. And, and it's been used to actually support or fuel anti-vaccination sentiment. Um, you know, here's an example. Uh, here, here's this woman holding up a sign. Uh, this was during COVID, you know, saying vax deaths, you know, UK 1,470, US 11,000, EU 18,000. You know, presumably she's uh, um, talking about um, our VAR system and similar systems in uh, Europe where deaths were reported after the COVID vaccine. <clears throat> um, and here she puts a little question mark, you know, maybe times 10. Uh, because not everything gets reported in there, right? Um, it's a passive surveillance system. Well, um, this uh, uh, gets to uh, um, what we, we as human beings want to do naturally. Our brains are really hardwired to make causal inferences. And I, I give this example here. Some of you may recognize uh, Jenny McCarthy. Um, you know, she was in some kind of B movies and uh, was a talk show host for a while. And for a while, her paramour was uh, the actor James Carey. Um, she has a son uh, named Dylan, who she's been very public about, um, who uh, developed some pretty significant um, developmental disability, uh, learning disability. And uh, her statement is that, you know, he was vaccinated and something changed. And she's, she's, I don't, I, she's said it on other venues, I don't care about all your studies, I'll cover out your science. My son is my science. And I'll ask my students, you know, is she unreasonable here? You know, she saw her boy growing up seemingly healthy, normal, and then something changed. And she was able to sort of link that happening. I don't know if it was days or weeks or months after a vaccine, but she thought that it followed a vaccine and, you know, was trying to make some connection, like why did he change? What happened to my son? And, and I would say that's not an unreasonable thing. Our brains are hardwired to look for reasons why bad things happen. 
Um, that's maybe captured a bit more in something that I heard a lot during the pandemic. Um, you know, we'd hear somebody going into the VAERS database saying something like this. I've heard that over 18,000 people have died from the COVID-19 vaccine. Is this true? Um, well, no, that's not true. Um, but it, it gets at something that uh, is sort of a half truth. Um, first of all, it's more like 9,000 people. A lot of people who were um, mining the data in the um, in the VAERS database didn't know that you have to put certain filters on so that you don't get duplicates. Sometimes reports have duplicates if, um, if, if they're reported in certain ways, and that's a common error in when you pull data. So oftentimes the numbers were doubled uh, from what they actually were. And, and there's a, a real issue with the term from versus after the vaccine. So it's true that there were uh, a few a couple of years back about 9,000 reported deaths after a COVID vaccine. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, from versus after. It's, a, it's actually a, a very big difference. <laughs> um, so this gets to uh, what's called the post hoc fallacy, which you know is a post hoc ergo propter hoc, meaning after it, therefore because of it, um, and that's a logical error. Um, there may be a correlation, but as we often like to say, you know, correlation does not equal causation. Uh, here, the kind of you know classic example is the rooster crows, the sun comes up, the rooster crows, the sun comes up, the rooster crows, the sun comes up. Um, is this tight, tight correlation with the rooster crowing before the sun comes up. Did the rooster cause the sun to come up? No. There's a strong correlation, but we know that's not causal. Uh, a better example and more to the point was in Dr. Paul Offit. Dr. Offit's a pediatric infectious disease specialist and a vaccine e expert, and he wrote in his uh, book, Deadly Choices, uh, about a, an example of a, um, I believe it was a friend or a colleague um, at another healthcare system who was a physician who had uh, brought his son uh, somewhere, I think, around the age of uh, six to eight months um, to, uh, I believe it was a flu clinic where they have, you know, like the stand in line, they have a, a flu blitz and you can kind of get get your kid vaccinated, uh, um, you know, on the spot without having to make an appointment. And it was, um, and this uh, dad, you know, stood in line for uh, quite some time. It was, it was after work. It was getting close to dinner time. He decided, uh, I'm waiting too long. I'm going to do this another day. And he went home uh, without uh, completing uh, the vaccine. Um, and very tragically and very sadly, his son died that night, presumably from SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome. And, and this uh, dad, uh, medical provider, you know, came to the realization, you know, in the wake of that tragedy, had he gone through that line and had he gotten um, his son vaccinated, it would have been very difficult for him not to have blamed that on the vaccine, that his healthy boy was fine. He goes to the, through the line, gets the vaccine and dies that uh, night tragically. Um, what else could it be, right? But he would have been 100% wrong because his son died um, tragically, uh, serendipitously from, um, from SIDS. And it would have just been um, uh, just by circumstance that it might have been might have been in association with the vaccine. It would have been an erroneous conclusion. To put a finer point on that, if we look at any given day in America, any day in America, we have about 540 people developing the new onset of a seizure. We've got about 2,200 people that will have a heart attack, about 2,500 people that'll have a blood clot like a DVT, another 2,200 people having a, a stroke, and about 8,000 people will die on any given day in America. Um, that is uh, every 160 seconds, somebody with a new seizure, every 39 seconds, a new heart attack, 35 seconds, a new blood clot, every 39 seconds, a new stroke, and every 11 seconds, someone will die in America. Now, think about that with um, the COVID vaccine as an example, uh, where we had, you know, a massive vaccination effort. And in the span of just a few months, we vaccinated almost uh, two thirds of the population, uh, 260 million people by June of 2022, and most of those by September of 21. So layer on top, uh, you know, of, of this mass vaccination effort, the fact that on any given day, we're going to have all these bad things happen to someone every 160 seconds, 39 seconds, 35 seconds, 11 seconds, every 11 seconds, somebody dying. 
of course, somebody's going to just die or have a stroke or have a heart attack or a blood clot or a new seizure just by happenstance, um, an hour, a day, a week, a month after getting a vaccine. Um, so uh, we have to be able to pull out that signal from the noise. And let's look at the deaths, for example. And here I'm picking on um, you know, the COVID vaccine since it was so fresh in our minds uh, on a lot of the safety issues. Here's the here's the deaths reported into uh, VAERS and the age distribution, and it's it's predominantly uh, the elderly, um, as you might expect. Um, uh, old people were a main target for the vaccine campaign, and old people die of heart attacks and strokes, and you know, uh, and are frequently make up one of those eight thousand uh, people, or in fact, the majority of those eight thousand people who die on any given day, and so it, it's sort of as we might expect in VAERS. So we have to have some way of pulling out a, a true signal of what really is from the vaccine, from the background noise of bad things happening to people every day. And to do that, you got to compare a vaccinated group to a control group of some kind, preferably an unvaccinated uh, group. Um, you can't assign causality without doing that. So all these people, you know, that will say, you know, this bad thing happened to my aunt Susie after a vaccine. I shrug my shoulders and go, wow, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope your provider uh, put a report into VAERS, but we can't really say whether it was a vaccine or not without more information. And that means looking at populations of, of uh, vaccinated people versus a control group. Now, VAERS, our, our big cogwheel in the middle, can't do that. We need other systems to do that. And um, and for that, we preferably want to look at active surveillance systems. So things that are trying to find uh, signals, um, not just passively waiting for reports. Uh, so as I've mentioned, passive surveillance are unsolicited reports of adverse events um, sent to a central database, and that's mainly VAERS. Active surveillance is proactive assessment. We've got a variety of large databases to do this. We often have captive populations so you can get a truer denominator, so you can get a real rate. Um, and these data are often used to verify signals from VAERS. So it doesn't stop with VAERS. VAERS generates a question, and then we investigate that question with better, more robust data. We do this with Vaccine Safety Data Link and a, uh, PRISM, BEST, and VSAFE, which I'll mention all uh, here in a second. First is the Vaccine Safety Data Link. If you take nothing else away from this talk, I hope you will remember this system because it's a really good, really important system in our uh, vaccine safety armamentarium. Vaccine Safety Data Link um, links uh, a number of uh, large integrated healthcare organizations in the United States, nine in total, um, that have robust electronic medical records. And they pool data uh, in these nine organizations, which is Kaiser out west, Health Partners in Minnesota, Marshfield Clinic in um, Wisconsin, the Harvard Pilgrim System out in Massachusetts, and the CDC Emory uh, System in Atlanta. Um, these nine organizations uh, cover over 12 million persons um, that we can dig deep into their medical records. And, and these, these um, patients are frequently uh, you know, captive in those systems. So we can use those systems to have a control group. So what kind of studies do we, we get out of these? Um, this is kind of what I call the hierarchy of evidence in the type of studies. You know, evidence quality and causality gets better and better as we move up this pyramid. And it's um, uh, pretty low or poor at assigning causality the lower on the pyramid. So when we have a case like Jenny McCarthy saying something bad happened to my son, that's tragic, that's noteworthy, but it does not get us uh, um, uh, anywhere near kind of saying that was causal. Um, randomized controlled trials are and meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials are the best, but as I've talked about, they're usually limited to the thousands to tens of thousands. They're expensive, they're hard to do, they take a long time, um, and, and you're not going to get those very rare adverse events. So uh, we can focus on these types of studies, prospective cohort studies, retrospective cohort studies, and case control studies. <clears throat> I won't go into the, the, this epidemiologic study design uh, too deeply, but these are very good, what we call epidemiologic studies or observational studies, 
where we can get closer to that question of causality, especially with the prospective cohort studies. And those can be done through these linked um, uh, uh, health systems, electronic medical records, and other types of systems where we can look at claims data, like insurance data. So here's an example of one of the reports here. This was published in JAMA, again, using the COVID vaccine as an example. So this is after the COVID vaccine was released, was out being used in circulation. A number of questions came up about its safety. So uh, vaccine, uh, the CDC said to Vaccine Safety Data Link, look, you know, we need to look into these these concerns people are raising and questions people are raising. And so they said, let's look at these this list. I think it's about 25. It's kind of fine print here, but you can kind of squint and look at that. These 25 bad things that people are wondering about, providers are wondering about, or maybe an AVERS safety signal, you know, 25 bad things. Let's take a look uh, at these in a vaccinated population um, compared to, uh, to a control group. <laughs> And they did that in almost 12 million doses of mRNA and 6.2 million individuals. So a huge number uh, of uh, in the study population. And they found no increased risk of any of these conditions except myocarditis in the 12 to 29 year old age group, particularly males, uh, where there was about a 3.7 fold increased risk and rare anaphylaxis, about five to eight per million, which was higher than other vaccines that are typically at about one out of a million. So there were a couple of safety signals um, uh, that uh, that uh, were uh, proven out of that and a whole lot that did not bear out. Um, there are other uh, safety systems that, that also do active surveillance uh, in a couple of those with potential control groups. So um, V-Safe, uh, you may have participated in this. If you, if you got a COVID vaccine, you were invited to um, participate in active surveillance on what happened to you after you got your vaccine. You get these text-based uh, reminders. Um, it was a smartphone-based monitoring program for COVID-19. Uh, launched in December of 2020, there was over 10 million VSAFE participants. So again, big number, um, completing more than 151 million health surveys about their experiences following the COVID vaccine. Uh, VSAFE data uh, have been included in more than 20 scientific publications. And a newer version of this launched, uh, I said was going to launch, I, I had this slide from uh, uh, last year, but so this is out now um, in uh, late last year, allowed users to share their post-vaccination experience with, with new vaccines, other vaccines other than COVID. Strengths to this are that anyone can enroll in vSafe. It's another way to quickly validate safety data from clinical trials or identify safety issues regular reminders to complete a survey. So like, you know, let, hey, we want to hear from you. CDC can follow up with participants and submit VAERS reports as needed. Um, limitations are that it may not properly represent the post-vaccination experiences of the entire population, meaning that, you know, people with smartphones who are willing to do this might not be exactly the same as, you know, everybody else out there. Um, and, and that might be, a, a, you know, slightly healthier or less healthy or anxious or less anxious or more health conscious or less health conscious, you know, population it might not be uh, truly representative, but uh, gets gets a, at a lot of uh, um, uh, data. PRISM is, is called the Post Licensure Rapid Immunization Safety Monitoring System. Uh, this is actually our largest vaccine safety surveillance system in the U.S., access to information for over 190 million people. This uses insurance claims uh, data um, to look at and evaluate possible safety issues. So it's not quite as deep a dive as going into the actual electronic medical record, but it does get it at, at, a, at a nice uh, kind of surface level. Um, something that might be serious enough to have generated a health claim or an insurance claim. Uh, so you can get, a, a, again, large pool to draw from for safety signals. Strengths are this large size, um, uh, uses this big database of health insurance claims. Limitations is that it can lag in time for accessing the PRISM data. Medicare population is not as well represented in PRISM, so it might not be getting you the best data for the elderly. Um, and it may not be representative of those without insurance coverage. So it's it's not completely representative. <clears throat> Last is uh, the BEST initiative, uh, also called the Biologics Effectiveness and Safety Initiative. <clears throat> uh, this is, again, another active system managed by the FDA. It's a complement to Vaccine Safety Data Link and VSAFE for conducting surveillance of adverse events following vaccination. 
It includes large scale claims data and electronic uh, health records and linked claims um, EHR. <clears throat> so a um, little bit more robust. Uh, it can allow us the use of a, a control group and it's near real time analysis with the data. Limitations again may that may not be representative of those without insurance coverage. And it can't determine if an association between an adverse and a vaccination is, is definitively causal, although it, it, it helps. So here's kind of these uh, listed all together that you can kind of look at um, with their different patient populations and their different sizes. So it's not just VAERS that we use. We've got multiple systems. Um, and I didn't even discuss, you know, all of these. There's a couple others with the Department of Defense and, and some other uh, initiatives as well uh, that you see at the bottom. Um, we also have uh, something called the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project, or CISA. This is an interesting uh, um, branch uh, of our vaccine safety uh, and regulatory process. This is a national network of vaccine safety experts from the CDC uh, and seven medical centers and some other partners that can be called upon to investigate safety signals or weird things that somebody may have observed. Uh, this project addresses vaccine safety issues. It conducts high quality research and assesses complex clinical adverse events following vaccination through active surveillance. <clears throat> um, so it's kind of like a SWAT team that can be brought in to uh, do a deeper dive on uh, some safety signal. Um, strengths here uh, serves as a vaccine safety uh, resource for our U.S. healthcare providers assist the CDC and its partners in evaluating emerging vaccine safety issues. They can implement prospective multi-site clinical studies with hundreds of subjects. So they can say, look, we want to study this further. Let's let's set up this uh, quick study to look into this. Um, they can look at safety in subpopulations. For example, uh, you know, we found that the safety signal for myocarditis in the COVID vaccine was really young males. It didn't it didn't come out in the general population, but it did come up, you know, looking at in, in subpopulations. They can receive detailed clinical data on patients and collect biological samples from patients. Limitations are that it's often a small sample size, limits its ability to study rare adverse events. And clinical trials can be labor and resource intensive, and it can be challenging to recruit and retain subjects. That's the kind of the bane of all research. All right, and then I, I think a really important but often not recognized uh, um, at, additional, uh, very valuable source of vaccine safety inform information comes from uh, data from other countries. <laughs> um, and, you know, where we have vaccine safety data link that covers uh, around 12 million population, nine health systems, a lot of other countries have a nationalized health plan. So they've got data from everyone in their, in their country. Um, so they can get very uh, robust data. And we saw for example, in COVID, lots of data coming out of Qatar, of, of all places, really high quality data, you know, a couple of publications in JAMA, the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, the UK has a nationalized health plan, so they have a, uh, almost their entire country, and really high quality data was coming out of there uh, on uh, from their UK health security agents, agency on a weekly basis uh, um, with some of their sur surveillance um, uh, that they were able to do. Um, Denmark has an excellent uh, surveillance system. Israel, uh, excellent surveillance system. South Africa ha has a very robust uh, surveillance system where we had some really uh, great publications coming out on vaccine uh, safety um, through the COVID pandemic. I'll give you one example of one of these publications. This one was out of Israel, um, kind of similar to the one I showed earlier uh, out of the U.S. from Vaccine Safety Data Link. This was out of Israel, which and this was a study on almost the entire population, again, looking at um, a host of different safety concerns about the COVID vaccine, about, again, about 25 different bad things that people wondered about maybe being caused by a COVID vaccine. And they said, you know, let's look at these in our large database vaccinated population, but let's do, let's take that one step further and look at these same conditions in our population for people who got COVID versus those who didn't get COVID. And this was earlier in the pandemic when you could split those out more easily. So the blue is looking at risk differences in vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And the kind of orange here is looking at the risk differences in people who got COVID versus didn't get COVID. And in the vaccine uh, group, they had almost 900,000 people in each arm, almost 900,000 vaccinated compared to not vaccinated. And in the COVID uh, branch, they had about 173,000 
um, in each group. Those who got COVID, 173,000 who didn't get COVID. And they said, all right, let's look at what we found. So first off, um, they found that certain things were lower in the vaccinated group. Um, there was less kidney, acute kidney injury. There was less arrhythmias and less intracranial hemorrhages. Don't know exactly why that is, but um, uh, those were lower, statistically significantly lower. Uh, and, and these numbers represent the the number of cases per 100,000 vaccinees. So minus five, minus six, minus three um, per 100,000. Um, uh, they did find some things that were higher. They found a higher incidence of shingles. Uh, they found a higher incidence of swollen lymph nodes, particularly in the axilla, which we know is a side effect of the vaccine. You can get swollen glands there. And the myocarditis, about three cases per 100,000 um, uh, overall, higher if you looked at the subpopulation of young males. Um, so they did detect some signals there. <clears throat> but compare that to the SARS-CoV-2 infected versus the non-infected. I mean, massively more serious problems, acute kidney injury, arrhythmias, deep vein thrombosis, intracranial hemorrhage, myocardial infarction, myocarditis was higher, pericarditis, pulmonary embolism. Um, again, we're weighing the safety of the vaccine versus the safety uh, or risks of the pathogen. And here, when they did this sort of apples to apples comparison, uh, the, the, the risks from the virus were markedly worse than the risks of the vaccine. So another question for you to ponder, uh, to kind of consider as we uh, progress through the rest of the uh, talk, which vaccine was suspended after safety surveillance detected a rare but serious adverse event related to intestinal blockage in infants, measles, mumps, rubella, rotavirus, influenza, or hepatitis B? If you were paying attention earlier in my talk, you probably should get this pretty, pretty easily, um, but hold on to that thought. So. Um, let's now look at how these systems work together uh, to find and manage potential safety issues using the rotavirus disease and vaccine as an example. All right, this was uh, the face of rotavirus. Uh, very sadly, uh, you know, in the pre-vaccine era, this is, uh, you know, in, typically an infant or a very young child presenting with diarrhea, vomiting, dehydration, which could um, sometimes lead to uh, vascular collapse and death. In the pre-vaccine era, we had about 3 million cases of this per year in the United States, about 410,000 physician visits, about a quarter of a million ER visits, and about 70 to 100,000 hospitalizations, and about 20 to 60 deaths from rotavirus every year uh, in the pre-vaccine era. Now, uh, the first candidate vaccine, uh, which was a live uh, oral vaccine, was developed, um, RotaShield. Uh, vaccine. The FDA approved this with the phase three trial being one on the small side, only 4,400 study subjects total. That was approved in August of 1998. VAERS identified 15 cases of intussusception. So only 15 cases. Um, it didn't have to find all of the cases of intussusception. It just had to find enough to generate a safety signal. And it did that. And the CDC actually suspended the use of the vaccine in July of 1999 and said, we need to investigate this further. Is this real? So the CDC used CISA, that sort of SWAT team, to go in and investigate these cases. They asked Vaccine Safety Data Link to do uh, um, some more intensive uh, case series analyses, uh, analysis, case control study, and a retrospective cohort study. From those they confirmed there was an association of intussusception with uh, uh, um, uh, a prevalence of about one out of 11,000 children developing this intussusception. And based on that, they withdrew the vaccine from the market in October of 1999. Um, so these safety systems found a signal, studied it further, found causality uh, or high likelihood of causality, and they withdrew it from the market. Well, you might understand why a parent might be hesitant to take that vaccine or any of the ones that came after it. <clears throat> um, but again, no vaccine is, has zero safety issues. We are comparing the pathogen to the vaccine. And you could make an argument, and some have made an argument, that the CDC shouldn't have stopped the vaccine and withdrawn it from the market uh, based on that uh, data. Um, so going back to that finding rare events using our rule of three, 
uh, being 95% confident that our sample size can detect events at a rate of 3 of n or greater. In the original Rotashield example, the cumulative incidence, so as a background rate, the cumulative incidence of rotavirus hospitalization, so serious illness for children up, going up to five years of age was one out of 160 kids was going to get pretty sick from rotavirus if they made it to the age of five. <clears throat> one out of 160. That phase three trial, pretty small, only 4,400 study subjects, only 2,200 in the vaccine arm, using our rule of three, three over 2,200, should have been able to find problems occurring at a frequency of 0.136% or one out of 733 or greater. So that wasn't enough to detect that rare uh, problem of one out of 11,000 risk of interception found later. But take note that it was still much better even if there would have been something as frequent as one out of 700, um, that that vaccine would have been better than that one out of 160 risk from the virus. And some people have argued that they shouldn't have withdrawn the virus from the, uh, or I'm sorry, the vaccine from the market <clears throat> uh, based on that. And, and it led to the discontinuation of this in multiple other developing countries that had worse rates of uh, hospitalization and death than us. And it's estimated that that many thousands of deaths may have occurred unnecessarily with the withdrawal of that vaccine from the market. Uh, be that So the pathogen, one out of 160, the vaccine should have been able to detect things more common than one out of 733. Probably not an unreasonable thing to have brought to market, um, but, it, and it turned, but it turned out there was a problem in one out of 11,000. <clears> but that did lead uh, vaccine manufacturers to study this further and develop newer candidate vaccines aimed at um, diminishing that risk of intussusception. So here's the a New England Journal uh, study of uh, the pentavalent human bovine reassortment rotavirus vaccine, the, the follow-up uh, vaccine. And here, you know, it took years later, almost, uh, almost seven years later <clears throat> uh, to get a vaccine. So we went seven years without anything. Um, and here it was like 68,000 study subjects. So the, CD, uh, the FDA required a much higher bar for safety um, uh, with the subsequent vaccine. So we had 68,000 study subjects uh, with the mono uh, and with the penavalent vaccine, uh, the other monovalent Rotorix, 80,000 study subjects. They did not find any additional risk in the in this large uh, phase three randomized controlled trial. <clears throat> that wasn't enough. CDC said, you've got to keep studying this uh, further with our vaccine safety data link. So they initiated a prospective cohort study through Vaccine Safety Data Link involving a half a million first doses and 1.27 million second doses of the RB5 vaccine. And lo and behold, they found another safety signal. Uh, really, really rare, about an additional one and a half into susceptions per 100,000 first dose recipients. But that risk was considered uh, a low enough uh, that this was uh, worth using this vaccine since uh, the the incidence of serious adverse effects from uh, actual rotavirus is so high. Um, if there's any questions, please put them in the chat um, and we'll try and get those to the end here. Um, and we're coming up on the end. Uh, so benefits and risks summary of estimates of the one rotavirus vaccinate, um, vaccinated birth, um, <clears throat> um, birth cohort to age five. Annual outcomes in the birth cohort, hospitalization, ER visit, death, prior, you know, caused by vaccination, about 45 hospitalizations, 13 uh, um, ER visits, maybe up to 0.2 deaths um, uh, in, in, a, in, in a birth cohort, uh, a typical birth cohort in the United States. Compare that with the numbers prevented by that vaccine, 53,000 hospitalizations, 100, almost 170,000 ER visits and 14 deaths. That's a um, uh, benefit to risk ratio of, uh, or, or prevented rotavirus outcome per excess into susception outcome of over 1,000 to one, 12,000 to one, 71 to one. Uh, way, way worth it. Finishing up here, let me let me give you a few other examples of uh, of uh, uh, signals that have been assessed. Uh, vaccine associated paralytic polio was identified with the oral polio vaccine, a live polio vaccine that we were using in the United States up until 
a few decades ago. This was detected in VAERS, and it was further studied in Vaccine Safety Data Link, data from other countries, and a few other systems. And then an Institute of Medicine review looked into all this data and said, yes, there's an association of the, vac the oral polio vaccine reverting to a more wild type and being able to cause polio. And was an action taken? Yes, they transitioned from the oral polio vaccination to the inactivated polio vaccine in the United States. So this was this was finding, you know, this was after years of uh, uh, of surveillance since the initiation of the polio vaccine in the 1950s. Um, DVT from uh, the human uh, papillomavirus vaccine. There was a signal that came up in VAERS and in vaccine safety data link that. It might be that women were getting deep vein thrombosis from the HPV vaccine. Uh, so uh, efforts were made to study this uh, in larger studies in vaccine safety data link. Denmark, Sweden, and Canada also initiated cohort studies. And in those larger studies and studies from other countries, no association was found. No additional action was taken. Johnson & Johnson, uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine and the association of um, vaccine-induced um, uh, uh, thrombocytopenic thrombosis. Um, so this was this rare form of blood clot, sometimes forming in the in the brain. Very serious uh, potential side effect. This was identified in VARES and in data from Europe. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, additional uh, data came out of Europe with follow up. CISA looked into this, uh, thought there was a causal link, vaccine safety data link, and VA data were all employed, and an association was found. And the vaccine uh, use was eventually limited, and the FDA eventually rescinded the emergency use authorization of that vaccine in the United States. <clears throat> mRNA COVID-19 vaccines and myocarditis or pericarditis initially came out from signals out of Israel, and it was verified in our VAERS database, uh, further studied in uh, vSafe, CISA, Vaccine Safety Data Link, Military Systems, the Cornet, which I didn't talk about, Department of Defense data and data from other countries. An association was found, uh, particularly in young males. Um, there was no change in the vaccine schedules, but we did uh, put into effect an optional eight-week interval between the first and second dose, particularly in uh, young people or, or uh, and especially young males. Uh, that was added to the recommendation, so a partial change, and, and that uh, extending that interval was uh, associated with a, a much lower incidence of uh, myocarditis. A few others here finishing up, uh, and I, I point these out because this is a different different sort of uh, reason for assessment. <clears throat> the use of thimerosal, or the mercury preservative, was it became a concern in um, and, you know it was causing autism. No signal was ever found for this. It was just public concern. They looked into this in VAERS, Vaccine Safety Data Link, CISA, the Institute of Medicine issued a report on this. We looked at data from other countries. No association was found, but because of the ongoing drumbeat of you know fears about this, actually uh, thimerosal was removed from all childhood vaccines. Some people said that was a mistake, sort of caving into unwarranted fears. Uh, hard to know what's the right thing to do there. Um, again, public concern about the HPV vaccine causing um, primary uh, ovarian insufficiency or a form of um, infertility. Looked into again, VAERS, CISA, vaccine safety data link, no uh, association found, no change was made to this vaccine. Pfizer's bivalent COVID-19 vaccine and possible stroke in 65-year-olds. This was a signal that came out of post-marketing surveillance in vaccine safety data link. Looked into further in VAERS, CMS and VA data, best data and data from other countries was not validated in better, higher quality and larger studies, no changes made. And more recently, uh, there's been some question of aluminum adjuvants in vaccine possibly being associated with asthma. Again, this kind of came out of public concern, was looked at in vaccine safety data, safety, <laughs> vaccine safety data link and data from other countries. And there's a maybe here. So Vaccine Safety Data Link found a, a kind of a weak association. Data from other countries has not uh, confirmed that association. Um, some action is being taken. Uh, majority of the data doesn't support the association, but this is um, now getting investment with bigger, better, uh, higher quality studies from these uh, various databases. So I'll just finish with a quote from uh, Maurice Hillman, one of the one of the developers of many of our current childhood vaccines. He was a brilliant vaccine researcher. 
And, you know, he said, I never breathe a sigh of relief until the first three million doses are out there. And this does acknowledge that we can't find every rare event in, in the initial FDA approval process. We rely on these uh, post licensure surveillance systems to find those very, very rare events, um, which hopefully are always rarer than the risk of the pathogen itself. So I hope that can help some of you in your confidence about our vaccine safety and regulatory process. I'm uh, touch over time here, but I'm happy uh, to take questions if there are some in the chat. So the first question I see um, is, is there an effort to ensure that persons with disabilities are included in phase three trials? Um, this, I think, gets to like even a bigger question about minorities and, and other subpopulations. And I, I, I guess I would have to say the answer to that is partially. Um, there, there's a greater and greater awareness that we need to do a better job of getting um, truly representative uh, populations um, into our, our trial data. Um, but as, as was pointed out by some critics, for example, the myocarditis uh, issue with that wasn't picked up in the original kind of safety deal. It was really a subpopulation of young males. And so you have to sometimes dive into the post licensure data. Um, there, I did see, for example, in the COVID trials, much greater effort to try and get in minority populations to be better represented. As to the question about disability patients, uh, with persons with disabilities in particular, um, I'm not, you know, I would say the answer to that is probably no with a caveat. And that is that um, the vaccine manufacturers and, and the trials are typically aimed at the groups that are considered to be at risk. So, um, for example, the RSV vaccine uh, for adults that just came out really, you know, emphasized looking at um, the elderly and included in those people with uh, chronic medical conditions, because we know those are, that's population at greater risk for severe outcomes from RSV. So it, it may target populations that may be at the highest risk. Um, but uh, I, I would say to be fair, uh, that, you know, subpopulations like maybe some particular disabilities uh, might have to come out in, in uh, those um, larger uh, cohort studies done in post-marketing surveillance. Second question was, does the FDA ever agree to use or authorize foreign vaccines such as the ones Europe can produce when fighting the same disease? No, uh, we do not accept any other country's uh, process or regulatory process. If they've approved it, that doesn't, we, we will not approve it. It has to go through our own FDA uh, trial and approval process. Um, they may look at that data and say, this looks like a worthy candidate vaccine and do the trials uh, in the US, but um, uh, I, I don't think you can, uh, they're, they're, the vac in fact, I'm certain vaccines cannot be approved based on another country's uh, data. Um, I do see there's a hand raised. I don't know if that's a, another question or something, but um, um, Maeve or whoever's all the questions for now. Okay. Thank you for answering those. Thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you again at our next webinar. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day. For those seeking continuing medical education credit and or one maintenance of certification point for the American Board of Pediatrics or for the American Board of Internal Medicine, you must complete the post test and evaluation. MLC points are only available for board certified doctors, fellows, or residents. To access the post tests and evaluation, please scan the QR code or follow the link available on the screen.